the title of this message, as you can see, is We Before Me. We Before Me. Say that with me. We Before Me. Even louder. We Before Me. It is the antithesis of how we're born. We're born very much oriented to our own needs. And it is only by the grace of God that we overcome that and we begin to consider we before me. I want to begin this time of teaching by looking at one of my favorite Proverbs. You know, the book of Proverbs is rich. It's so beautiful. And I encourage anybody to study this book. It has 31 chapters. And so maybe beginning December 1st, you could just chapter by chapter, day by day, go through the entire book of Proverbs and read it. But the first proverb, the, the one proverb we're going to read this morning, and it's the one I based this message on, is Proverbs 17:17. 17, 17. Let's read it off the screen together because it's just so deep. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. It's such a wonderful thought, and I think that's one of those foundational verses for any sort of fellowship that we have in the church. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. I think key to understanding any scripture is at times looking at how it was originally written to the people it was written to and the words that were written. Because, you know, more than 2,000 years ago when this proverb was written, it wasn't written in English, it was written in Hebrew. And the word friend that we see that is translated in English here from Hebrew is actually the Hebrew word reya. Reya means friend or companion. Hey, simple enough. Don't think there's any further explanation needed on that key word. But there's another key word that appears. I think it could use a little bit more illustration. The word brother in this verse comes from the Hebrew word ach. Ach, meaning brother or same tribe. Now the thing is, we know what brother means. A lot of us here have brothers. I've got a brother. I know what brother means. And we also understand like the connotation when we say, hey, brother. When we come up to somebody and we use that as a greeting of an affectation, we understand what that means but we really don't understand what the whole connotation of being from the same tribe means. Our modern world, we've kind of done away with the whole notion of tribe. I mean, don't get me wrong. We have like these sort of pseudo tribes. I'm a Bears fan. I'm a Vikings fan. I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. All these different things. These are kind of tribes, but they're really not what we're talking about with this word ach. Because you have to understand, in Old Testament times, to the people it was written to, they very much understood the word brother from the same tribe, sister from the same tribe. They understood it because your tribe was a big deal. It meant life or death. Your tribe were the people you farmed with, that you shepherded with, that protected you from people that were coming in to take what was yours. They were the people that drew water with you and ensured your survival through the harsh winter or the harsh summer. Your tribe was a big deal. And we've kind of lost that. You know, our world is much safer and more predictable than it used to be because of technology and automation, but it also means we've kind of lost the essence of what this verse means. But you know, a year and a half ago, my wife Andrea and I were on a trip and we saw, it just brought me back to something, an illustration of what the whole notion of tribe is in our modern world. You know what it was? We were on a trip in southwestern Wisconsin and we we came into territory where we saw a lot of these. In southwestern Wisconsin, you encounter a lot of Amish communities. You'll go into towns where you'll see signs that say, watch out, horse and buggy may be on the highway. And sure enough, you'll see children, you'll see adults, and this is their means of transportation. The Amish community has chosen, in order to kind of keep themselves separate from the world at large and to be less dependent on technology, they've said, we're not going to use cars. We're not going to use power tools. We're not going to be plugged into the internet. We're going to remain separate from those things in a desire to keep the essence of our identity, our tribe. And that's something that we, I think most of us, have totally lost in our society. And really, this whole Amish mentality comes back to the title of this message, We Before Me. In the Amish community, you can't be a lone wolf. It just doesn't fly there. You have to think of your brothers and sisters before yourself. We before me. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Philippians chapter 2. Do not merely look out for your own interests, your own personal interests, but also for the interests of 
others. We do not have to be taught in any way, shape, or form to look out for our own interests. Again, we're born with that. And the number one question that we're born asking day after day in our lives is what's in it for me? How does this personally benefit me? It's only by the grace of God that we transcend that, we go beyond that, and we begin asking these questions. What's in it for you, God? How can my life reflect your glory and bless you today? Oh, and by the way, Lord, how can my life bless other people? And you know, the beautiful thing is when we have a mindset of blessing God and other people first, what happens? We are then blessed back because of that. It always happens. When we look to the needs of other people before our own, we are blessed back because of that. One of the crises in our modern world because of this lack of connectedness is that people feel isolated, they feel lonely, they come to the end of their lives, and there's nobody there because it's a sad fact. For many people, they end up with zero friends. I mean, we have acquaintances, we have coworkers, we have people that might be paid to be in our presence, but do we really have friends? We are lacking in something that we see in the New Testament called koinonia. Koinonia is a word that applies 20 times throughout the New Testament. And it really is almost always translated as fellowship. It's a Greek word, and we see it in Acts 2.42. They were continually, that is the Jesus followers, were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. That word koinonia is what was originally written in Scripture to the breaking of bread, which means having meals together, and to prayer. See, koinonia is fellowship, but it's more than just that, because I think we can kind of think of fellowship as a passive thing. Fellowship is like, I want to go hang out with my friends. And a lot of times our mentality is like, I just, I just need to be there, have, have some people that we're going to watch the game together, we're going to share a meal together, and we're going to receive something out of it. But really koinonia is, it's deeper than that. Koinonia is all about participation and contribution. It's not passive, it's giving something. And I can think of a beautiful illustration of this concept. Hey, I'm gonna go right back to the Amish community. I wanna show you a picture of something. Everybody know what this is right here? What's that? That is amazing. Almost everybody here recognizes that. Few people have any background or experience directly in the Amish community, and yet we know what this is. This is an Amish barn raising. This right here is a community coming together saying we're going to bless a family, we're going to bless an individual because that person cannot do it by himself or herself. We're going to collaborate with our hands, our God-given efforts, and we're going to build something together, we before me. Say it again, we before me. That is a perfect illustration of what Koinonia Fellowship is about. It's not passive. It's not what's in it for me. I'm going to receive. Give me. It's participation and contribution. In his letter to the church in Rome, what we know is the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul sets out what I think is a beautiful roadmap of what this we before me is supposed to look like in our lives. And so I invite you as you're able to stand with me as we read through Romans chapter 9 excuse me, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, this roadmap of we before me. Apostle Paul writes this, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. 
In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And then finally, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This right here is such a great roadmap for us to understand how exactly do we live a life that says we before me. It's one thing to set out and say we want to do that, but I think Paul gives some very practical applications, some great challenges in here for us to understand how we put others before ourselves. And so beginning in verse 9, I want us to just take a look at that. Paul writes, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. Again, that concept of we before me. Paul is not saying here or in Philippians 2, 4 that we can never look over on our own interests. He's just saying honor others above yourselves. Put others first. God first, others second, yourself third. Continuing on in in verse 13, Paul writes, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. One of the important functions of our church is to share with those in need. Therefore, we give. We give to those in need. We support those who don't have enough. And we practice hospitality in that we make this place welcoming and warm. This afternoon, you heard it earlier, Connor asked for a show of hands of those who are part of Light Keepers. Light Keepers can simply be called this, a ministry of welcoming and hospitality in our church. They're going to decorate. And why? Because we want this place to sparkle. We want this place to just sing with the love of Jesus from when people just drive by or peek in the windows or come in here in the sanctuary of the commons that it would be beautiful that they're drawn here, that they want to spend time here. That's hospitality, making people feel welcomed and loved. Paul says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. How hard is that challenge? Oh, it's one of the hardest in the entire New Testament. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Oh, that's so hard. Because when people make our lives miserable. What do we want to do in return? We want to curse them. We want to, we want to trash them, if not to their face, at least to everybody else behind their back. But Paul is saying the opposite. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Have you thought about maybe praying for somebody who's making your life miserable? He's going to have more words about that in a moment. He also instructs us, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And important, oh, it's such a key function of the church is this is that we are here in fellowship so that when people are rejoicing, we share in that joy. You ever gotten great news, the birth of a child or a grandchild, a promotion, a new house, and you just can't wait to share it with somebody? Your heart is full. And if it's just you that gets to know that news, you have joy, but it's limited. It's when you share it with other people that your joy is really made full. That's part of the function of the church, is that we rejoice with each other. But probably even more importantly, we are here to mourn with those who mourn. People who have gone through the loss of a loved one, they're in a time of unbelievable, sometimes unspeakable tragedy and loss. And it doesn't mean that we can come in and fix that loss, but it does mean this, by the power of the Holy Spirit in a small way, we can share the love of Jesus just by being present for them by praying for them, by just sitting with them quietly and listening, being there for them. That's what it means to mourn with those who mourn. Never shy away from that. When the Lord brings somebody to you who's hurting, rather than running away out of awkwardness or being uncomfortable, say, Lord, I'm going to ask your supernatural help in this situation. Give me the words to say and to keep me away from the words I shouldn't say, to be present and to minister in this moment. Continuing on, Paul writes in verse 17, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. Is that an easy thing to do? Well, actually, that's kind of begging the question. Is it possible to really live at peace with everyone on this planet? Did Jesus live at peace with everyone? Did Jesus encounter conflict? I see you shaking your head there, Jim. It's right. Jim, everyone, Jesus, he he came into conflict with the Pharisees. He came into conflict with his apostles. He came into conflict with crowds. 
And it's not because Jesus was there to stir up trouble and and to create enemies. It wasn't that. It was that in living our lives, we are at times going to encounter conflict. But read what Paul is saying here. He's saying, in the eyes of everyone, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. What he's urging us to is instead of being pugnacious, people who are quick to an argument, quick to disagree, quick to show people where they're wrong, and quick to judge people, he's saying be the opposite. Be gentle. A soft answer. Be one that shows grace. Give people grace. Give an allowance for people in, maybe when they want to fight with you, that you just say, I, I'm not going to return fire. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. The reality check is this. Even if we do everything right, even if we try to be as gentle and gracious as we can to people around us, we're still going to encounter conflict. But let's not ourselves be the source of that conflict unnecessarily. Continuing on in verse 19, Paul writes, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Paul is quoting the Old Testament right here, and he continues on in in verse 20. He writes more about this. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. What Paul is referring to is this, is taking the human dynamic and completely flipping on its head. The human dynamic is this. He hit me first. I had no choice but to hit him back. Somebody's done me wrong. I'm going to settle that score. The human dynamic is that we are going to look out for our own interests. And if somebody hurts us or someone we love, we're going to hurt them right back. But instead, Paul says, short circuit that. By the power of the Holy Spirit, do the complete opposite. Your flesh is saying hurt, but God is calling you to this. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And the illustration right here is heaping burning coals on someone's head. Not to hurt them, not out of revenge, but in this. In that sometimes by giving somebody something they don't deserve, by blessing them when maybe what they have coming is not a blessing, by being gracious over and above, showing the love of Jesus just like he showed to us when we didn't deserve it. In doing that, it's amazing how God can sometimes transform enemies and turn them into friends. Because those burning coals represent this, our conscience. The Holy Spirit interacting with our conscience and saying, you were wrong. It's an opportunity for someone to come to repentance and to change and to overcome that cycle of conflict that we find ourselves mired in time and again. And then wrapping up everything in this chapter, Paul writes this in verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Friends, I'm going to confess something to you. In this world, seeing all that's going on around us, not just here in the United States, but in the world, my heart is hardening. And that's because we are encountering in this world things that they should disturb all of us. These are hard times for so many. God is blessing us despite those things and through those things and in those things. And yet, we are bearing witness to just some of the most difficult things that people can go through. And it's happening in our community, it's happening in our nation, it's happening in our world, and it troubles me. I have no doubt that everyone here reads the news, and we're troubled by some of those same things. But the question is, what are we doing in reaction to those things? The human condition would just get hard in our hearts. And the reason for that is simple. When we encounter things that make us fearful or anxious or angry, our hearts become hard as a protective mechanism. It's really simple. We feel like we're under attack or those we love are under attack or institutions we believe in under attack. And so we harden our hearts because we're angry and we're fearful. But that's not the position that God wants us to take. Paul reminds us, do not be overcome by evil. If you feel your heart hardening, like I, I got to admit, I feel my heart hardening. The first thing we have to do is, Lord, help me live out Romans 12, 21. Don't let my heart be overcome by evil, but this. But overcome evil with good. If we see something in the world that troubles us, what are we going to do about it? 
instead of reacting negatively with hardness toward those who disagree with us, what if we prayed for them? What if we took time to contribute monetarily to those institutions and the people and the causes we believe in? What if we fought for those things, not in the sense of being pugnacious and trying to pick a fight, but fought in the sense of protecting and fought in the sense of sharing the radical love of Jesus despite all the darkness we see all around us? Again, it's the way to short circuit that cycle of conflict that we find ourselves personally and as a nation in. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Instead of thinking of our own interests, we say, we before me. You know, again, I just come back to that picture of that Amish, that Amish barn raising. And as we look at those individuals right there, I promise you, there's conflict in that community. There are people who are jealous of one another. There's people that have, they've got long-standing grudges with one another. But what they do is they set those things aside in order to participate and contribute to one another's lives. That koinonia of fellowship that all of us are deeply longing for is on display right here. <laughs> and in the same way we, as Christ followers here in Geneseo, Illinois, were called to that same kind of fellowship, and so we always, always in our messages try to include next steps. What can our next steps be if the Lord is speaking to you about this concept of we before me, of koinonia fellowship in your own life, of participating and contributing? Well, our next steps might look something like this. How about this? We have tons of opportunity for koinonia fellowship right here in our church. It starts with this. We have ministries that would love, it would welcome your participation and contribution. Light keepers this afternoon with decorating. The worship ministry, we would be delighted to have you be a part of what we're doing. Youth ministry, children's ministry, women's ministry, men's ministry. We have outreaches to feed the homeless in Rock Island. We have outreaches that provide beds for children here. We have so many ways that we can participate and contribute through the church. But it's not just the church. We have organizations here in our community, the Geneseo Atkinson Food Pantry, Rebuilding Together in Henry County is a great way to contribute and participate. These are 100% valid ways to practice koinonia fellowship in our community. And I urge you, don't just think about, head out to the information center, go there and you'll find tons of ways you can participate in that kind of fellowship. But let me give you a a real personal challenge this week, and it's a simple one, but I absolutely believe this can be a stepping stone to something profound. Think of somebody right now. Ask the Lord, Lord, show me somebody that I can spend an hour of quality time this week, maybe over coffee or buy them lunch or just spend time by going to their house and checking in on them. If there's somebody that's unable to leave their home because they're shut in, spend time with someone in koinonia fellowship, where you are participating and contributing to their life, listening to them, finding their needs, praying for them. See, instead of just going to your same old tried and true friends, maybe find somebody you haven't connected with in a long time, or maybe find somebody you've never connected with. Build a bridge. Be the love of Jesus to somebody. And again, by pouring out your life, by spending time in fellowship with somebody else and putting your focus on them before yourself, I promise you, you will be blessed as a result of that. If we as a church, even a small percentage, took that seriously and did that this week, I promise you, we'd be a better connected church, a richer and more fellowship-driven church just this week. It is amazing what one small step can take on the path towards something big. And so with that, I'm going to ask you as you're able, would you stand with me as we pray over everything we've read this morning? A message is meaningless without application. And so let's take a moment and humble ourselves before God and ask him to show us how we may apply this in our lives. Lord, we thank you. Your word is always true. You always show us next steps that we can take to follow your word. Lord, we've been challenged this morning, both through Proverbs 17, 17, but also through the words of Paul in Romans chapter 12, about what it means to live we before me. 
it's so hard because it cuts against everything in our own hearts. But Lord, we know by the power of your Holy Spirit, if we're open to being transformed, Lord, that you can take those tendencies and you can banish them. And that, Lord, we can, as a vessel of your love, we can show the love to people all around our community and to you. And from that, Lord, we trust we would be blessed. So, Lord, we make this personal. We humble ourselves. We don't have it all figured out. Lord, show us the next step for us today whether it's to sign up to participate in ministry here, whether it's just to get on our phone or call or text someone and invite them to fellowship this week, Lord, we pray that you would show us how we can apply this. Lord, we love you and we trust you and we ask this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Agreeing, we say, amen. amen.